Welcome back to chapter six. This week we will be talking about life's mainspring and introduction to energy. So the sections that we'll cover in this chapter are 6.1, energy is central to life, 6.2, the nature of energy, 6.3, how is energy used by living things, 6.4, the energy dispenser called ATP, 6.5, efficient energy use in living things or enzymes, 6.6, .6, enzymes in the activation barrier, and 6.7, regulating enzymatic activity. So just as a heads up, we're going to briefly cover sections 6.1 and 6.2 in the lecture. You don't have to read these sections, but make sure you know what's on the next two slides. So in the next two slides, I will kind of cover a condensed version of 6.1 and 6.2. For your outline for homework, uh, make sure that you include the main points from the following slides, but you don't need to include anything else from the book unless you really want to. So for 6.1 and 6.2, we're going to be talking about energy, and all living things need energy. So first off, let's cover what is energy. And energy is simply the ability to do work. It's really the ability to do work is just something. So anything that you need to do, anything that your body needs to do, takes work or takes energy. And why is this an important topic in biology? Well, everything that needs to be done in any living thing will take energy. And the first thing that's important to look at is where the original source of all that energy. So if everything on earth takes energy, where do living things get that energy? And we get almost all of our energy uh, originally from the sun. So every living thing on earth, that initial energy source for all living things is the sun. And just to go over one point, energy can't be created or destroyed. This is the first law of thermodynamics. But energy can be transferred from one thing or one form to another. And what happens is the energy from the sun is first captured by plants. So as you can see in this picture here, sunlight energy comes down to the earth. Plants are actually able to take that energy and convert it into sugar. And so they convert it into a form that's usable then by other living things. So the sunlight energy goes into the plants. The plant energy can be captured by animals who eat those plants. And then other animals can use energy from that animal, such as drinking milk from a cow, eating meat from an animal. And so other animals can get energy from either eating plants or from eating other animals. And so again, the energy that comes in from the sun, it doesn't ever get created or destroyed, but it can move from one form such as in plants to another form such as in, inner, such as in animals. Now, energy transfer isn't perfect. So whenever you have any kind of um, reaction that involves transferring energy, such as from um, plants to animals or um, something like that, the some of the energy will always be lost as heat. And this is the second law of thermodynamics, that in any reaction that you have, it's not a perfect energy transfer and you'll get some energy lost as heat. So when energy is transferred from plants to animals or animals to other animals from eating, some of that energy um, is transferred into the animal and some is lost as heat. And this loss as heat is actually important to keeping those animals warm. So think of when you run fast for a while and you start getting hot, it's taking a lot of energy to use all those muscles and some of that energy that you're using is used to keep your body going and some of it's giving, given off as heat. And that's why you get hot when you run because you're doing a lot of reactions quickly and giving off a lot of heat quickly. You can also think of a car engine that takes energy from gas um, to make that engine run. Some of the energy runs the engine and some of the energy is given off as heat. So your car will start getting hot the more that those reactions in that engine occur. So that's why your car needs coolant to constantly absorb all the heat from those um, from that engine running. Energy can be used in your body and um, gets used in two different ways. And one way is that living things need to be able to accumulate energy to store it for later use. And they also need to be able to then later use this energy. Reactions that give off energy are called exergonic reactions. And these are reactions that when they happen, energy is released and that energy then can be used for something in the body. Reactions that accumulate or store energy are called endergonic reactions. And what overall, if you were to look at the amount, let's say this line going up here is the amount of energy. So you start out in an endergonic reaction with no energy. You have some kind of energy input. You go over this um, later. We'll talk about this activation energy needed to get the 
reaction started, and then you'll end up with a higher amount of energy than what you started with. Now, this energy didn't come from um, just out of nowhere. It came from somewhere, but the end result in this reaction is that you end up with a product that has more energy in it than the product that you started with, and that's an endergonic reaction. And again, going up and down here, this is no energy to a lot of energy. In an exergonic reaction, you start out with a certain amount of energy, you put a little bit in, of energy in to get the reaction started, and then um, you drop down energy, and this here is the amount of energy released from the, from the um, reaction. So in an in exergonic reaction, there's a lot of energy released. In an endergonic reaction, there's energy taken in and then stored for later use. So as we discussed, you can't create energy. So you'll um, need an exergonic reaction to give off the energy needed to fuel an endergonic reaction. So you need energy being given off in this type of reaction to fuel a reaction where energy was stored. And um, this combination of reaction is called a coupled reaction. So I'm sure this probably gets confusing, but just think of it as one reaction providing the energy for the next reaction. So just like you might eat a granola bar to give you energy to ride your bike, many of the reactions in your body need energy to run. And so you'll have some reactions that store energy for later and then other um, reactions that take up in a lot of energy and use that energy. Now there's a certain type of molecule called ATP that is the sort of like the fuel for all the reactions in your body. So we know that you think of gasoline for a car as the source of energy for a car. So unless you put that gasoline in there, assuming you have a standard gas running car, um, your car can't run. And so your car constantly needs that gas to be put into it in order to run. Well, our body, its form of gas is a substance called ATP. And that's the source that all living things use as energy. And ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And what that is, is adenosine is this group of a sugar group, this ribose here, hooked to a nitrogen group called adenine. When you put this nitrogen and the sugar together, they call that adenosine. And then the triphosphate, TP for triphosphate, stands for tri means three, and phosphate just means a phosphate group. And so that means it has three, one, two, three phosphate groups on it. And let's look at next how it is that ATP serves as an energy. So what happens is you start out with um, actually this molecule here, which is your adenosine and only two phosphate groups. And so again, adenosine is a sugar and a nitrogen group hooked together over here. And triphosphate means three phosphates. The three phosphates have a negative charge. Like, um, so think of if you have a magnet with a negative end and a positive end. And so all those phosphates have a negative charge to them. And what you start out with originally is adenosine diphosphate. So it, adenosine with two phosphates on it. And to make adenosine triphosphate, which means you put this third phosphorus on it, it takes a lot of energy to bring this phosphorus over and put it when you already have negative charges over here. So if you think of normally like charges will repel each other, opposite charges attract. So negative and positive ends of a magnet would hook together. But with all these phosphates, you have all these negatives that when you go to put this um, other phosphate group on here, it takes a lot of energy because you're trying to put this negative with a lot of other negatives. And so when you do this, it takes a lot of energy. Think of pushing two ends of a strong magnet that are the ends that don't attract. Think of trying to push those together. It takes a lot of energy to get them together. So it takes energy to go from this a adenosine diphosphate with two phosphates to adenosine triphosphate with three phosphates. As the book mentions, it's like forcing a jack-in-the-box into the box and closing the lid. So you have your jack-in-the-box here, you get that energy, you push it down, push that spring down, and then close the lid. And so once you've done that, you've sort of created this stored energy in here. And ATP is the same way. It's sort of the stored energy that's forced into this group together. And as soon as you, like in the jack-in-the-box, as soon as you release the lid, the jack-in-the-box 
pops out, releasing a lot of energy. And the same thing with our ATP, which we'll talk about coming up next. When you allow it to release one of those phosphates, that phosphates go shooting off and it gives this burst of energy. So it's basically what I said here. When a phosphate's released from the ATP molecule, energy is given off. An ATP is like this closed jack-in-the-box, just waiting to be opened and allow that jack-in-the-box or that phosphate to be released and give off energy. So let's talk about ATP and energy use in living things. So as we mentioned on the last slide, you have your ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and your loose phosphate group over here. It takes energy to hook that phosphate onto this molecule and make ATP. So this would be like having a charged battery. You have this molecule with a lot of energy charged up and ready to be used. When you allow that phosphate group to be released, it releases energy. You then have a separate adenosine diphosphate and phosphate group. They're separated and you have this release of energy that goes off. This ADP now is like a dead battery. But what happens is this phosphate group doesn't go too far. It just sits here and waits for when the body has more energy to hook that phosphate group back onto the adenosine diphosphate to push it back together. So you add it when that energy is available, it pushes those two back together and they become ATP again. You have your charged battery again, you have your energy source ready and waiting to be used. And again, whenever your body needs to, it can shoot off that phosphate group release energy to use for other reactions in the body. And again, then you have like this dead battery sitting here. And so this, this cycle just constantly continues where you go from ADP to ATP. And now we've talked about ATP being the energy source for all of these reactions. These reactions also take something else to help them run, and these are called enzymes. So this is in section 6.5 of your textbook. And an enzyme is a type of protein that accelerates the rate at which a chemical reaction takes place in a living thing. So they help jumpstart the reaction and help the reaction go. And nearly every chemical process that takes place in a living thing is facilitated or helped by an enzyme. So for example, the enzyme lactase help split apart the sugar lactose into its two component sugars, the sugars that it's made up of, glucose and galactose. And so um, enzymes sort of look like this here. They have sort of this binding site. And what happens is the two substrates are the things that it's going to um, help react will go into this binding site. They're similar in shape. and the enzyme will help go from, let's say, these two separate molecules into this these two combined molecules. So this will also take energy to occur, but the enzyme sort of creates this place where the reaction can occur and just helps that reaction along. So again, the substance that an enzyme helps transform through this chemical reaction is called the substrate. That's the stuff that goes in and comes out um, is our is our substrate. And so if you're talking about breaking down lactose into two different sugars, lactose is the substrate and the enzyme is called lactase. So enzymes tend to have this ASE ending. And again, it's not really important that you know the names. This is just an example. But again, the enzyme is has this specific shape that helps take something, <coughs> excuse me, and um, take it through, take it, transform it from one thing to another, whatever, and whatever reaction that is that's occurring. All right, so that's the end of our chapter six lecture. And just to give you a heads up, there is no lecture next week, so you can focus on your next test. And we will start back again with chapter seven during week eight. So we will continue with chapter seven. We just have a week off of lecture. And then we will continue with chapter seven during week eight. Hope you have a great rest of your week and let me know if you have any questions. So um, many activities in living things are controlled by metabolic pathways in, in which a series of reactions is undertaken in sequence. And so this is just where several steps need to occur in your body um, in whatever 
is going on in your body. So in such a series, the product of one reaction becomes the substrate for the next. So here, if you look at this picture, we have these three different enzymes. Enzyme A helps take these two different things and combine it into this. Enzyme B takes in this and combines it into this. And then enzyme C is taking um, this and combine it in changing it into this. So a metabolic pathway is just when you're looking at several different reactions that need to occur in order to get the end product that you need. So you can't just go instantly from this to this. Um, it has to go through several different steps to get there, and we call that a metabolic pathway. So enzymes will normally take the form of a globular or ball-like protein, and you can see that in this shape here, and they tend to have this pocket in there into which the substrates will fit. So this, whatever this shape right here, this pocket is a shape matching the substrates. And so this substrate won't fit into that enzyme because it's the wrong shape. These two will fit here because they match the shape. This will fit here because it matches this shape. And the pocket is called the active site and it's the portion of an enzyme that binds with a substrate helping to transform it. So this area here, is called the active site. Not the same thing, active site here and active site here. Now another thing that enzymes do besides fitting the shape and helping transform things is they lower the activation energy of a reaction and that's the energy that's required to start the chemical reaction. And so let's say you're looking here at, if you look at your chemical reaction as um, trying to go from this point to this point. Think of it like pushing a ball up a hill. So you have to get the ball up to the top of the hill and then finally once it goes to the top of the hill the reaction can occur and the ball can easily roll down the hill. But this initial input of energy needed to get that reaction started is called the activation energy. And so if you don't have an enzyme the activation energy tends to be very high. Reactions go very slowly so it takes a lot of energy input to get that reaction to occur. But when you have an enzyme it lowers the activation energy so that means it will only take a little bit of energy to get that reaction started. And um, so you can see here this is your activation energy. Just a little bit of energy you can get that reaction going. So with enzymes reactions occur um, typically much more quickly than they would without enzymes. And um, so enzymes are called catalysts and that's a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without itself undergoing any permanent chemical change. So the enzyme is sort of this helper here that helps the reaction go more quickly, helps get it started, but the enzyme does not change chemically in that process. It is the exact same before and after the reaction. So the things going in and out of it definitely do change our substrate, but the enzyme itself stays the same. So it can be used over and over and over again as much as you need that reaction to occur. The sum of all the chemical reactions that a cell or larger um, living thing carries out is called its metabolism. You've probably heard of your metabolism before. You're thinking of as breaking down food um, for energy, and really that's what it is. It's breaking down all of your food that you eat, all your proteins, your carbohydrates, your fats, and your lipids, and all the reactions that those things go through to give your body energy. And so all these different reactions, not important that you know these, just want to show you kind of what that looks like in your body, but all those reactions where you're breaking down everything you eat to get energy, all those are called your metabolism. And enzymes are active in all of these different reactions. So if you're looking at whether you're breaking down a protein, a carbohydrate, a fat, a lipid, however you're doing that and getting ATP as energy, no matter which of these reactions you're going through, they all take enzymes to help them go. Now, one important thing with an enzyme is that it can, that your body is able to control the enzyme activity. And that means that Substances aren't constantly just going into that enzyme and being um, released when that reaction is not needed to occur. And so there are two different ways in which your body can control those enzymes and help them to not just be running nonstop when they're not needed, but allow them also to run when they are needed. And one way is through competitive inhibition. 
and that's a reduction in the activity of an enzyme by means of a compound other than the enzyme's usual substrate binding with the enzyme in its active site. So if you look at this as your enzyme, this picture in your text is for the next type of regulation, but um, just to look at the shape of an enzyme, if this is where the substrate would normally bind to it, what happens in competitive in inhibition is that some other substrate will bind right here. Something else will bind and just sort of block it. And that way, whenever the substrate that normally would go into the enzyme comes along, it has nowhere to go because the enzyme is just plugged up and blocked. And that's called competitive inhibition. Another way of controlling the enzyme is by allosteric regulation. And this is where something goes in to another spot on the enzyme, such as it could be the product that that enzyme created. It goes into another end and then that changes the shape of the enzyme and so this substrate doesn't fit into it anymore. And so the substrate just kind of floats around here waiting until that enzyme, until um, this goes away and the enzyme opens up and becomes the right shape again and then that chemical reaction will occur. So these are two different ways that your body can either get, um, your enzymes can get plugged up or they can change shape so that those reactions don't occur when your body doesn't want them to occur. And then again, they will go back to their normal shape when your body needs a reaction to occur.